This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. Then we see the third and fourth type of witness. They're, they're together. Jesus kind of clumps them together. Uh, they're in verses 36 through 38. There were uh, and are to this day two types of witnesses in this category. The first one is those who believed him and followed him. These were the, this was the third category of witness. Those who saw Jesus perform miracles and so they believed him. Wow. Jesus said the miracles that I do are going to confirm who I am. And so they saw these miracles and they followed him. But re- notice that he doesn't say that it changed their life. They just decided to follow him. Because that's kind of cool. Look what he did. He made a blind person see. He made a crippled man walk. You know, he could do all of these things. Let's follow this guy. He's obviously connected. So let's follow him. And so they became a kind of witness to a degree. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of church members in the world today who fit this category. They're just following along because they're wanting to see something happen. And it hasn't really changed their life. They're good people. They're moral people. But their lives aren't really, really changed. Then, the fourth category are those who rejected his truth because they only sought the sensational. In other words, they followed him for a while, but then after a while, they just stopped. There was no point. They they got tired of it. It was no longer fashionable to follow Jesus. And so, you know, it it wasn't cool anymore. And so they quit following him. They followed him temporarily because he was popular and because it was fashionable. I remember when I came to know the Lord, which was back, um, oh, back around 1970. Uh, I, when I came to know the Lord, it was during the, the Jesus movement. Remember the Jesus people? And, you know, I mean, uh, that was, there was a, a spiritual movement that, that it was really the last kind of revival movement across America. Well, that's where I came to know the Lord. And uh, the guy that led me to the Lord, uh, there, were, there were two men that God used. Um, one was a pastor of a church in St. Louis, uh, Bob Ferguson, and then this guy named Gary, Gary Bentley. Gary was um, with the Christian World Liberation Front, which was out of California, and he was a Jesus freak. I mean, I mean, he fit the bill. He had this raggedy kind of blonde hair and these piercing blue eyes, and he wore a denim shirt that it was open to his belly button, and he wore a white wooden cross, and he had bell bottoms, you know, and he was just, I mean, he was the ultimate Jesus people guy. And uh, he was the one that confronted me about who I was and, and God's purpose and plan for my life at a time when I had no purpose and plan, didn't believe I should even exist, thought I was a mistake. And God used those two guys in my life to help me come to know truth and and to discover what that was all about. During that time, and when I committed myself to Christ, there were a lot of people that were doing that. A lot of people that were doing that. A year later, two years later, I have no idea where most of those people are. They just kind of walked away. It was fashionable. It was kind of the cool, hip thing to do. Call yourself a Jesus freak. You know, to be a Jesus people and to kind of hang with that crowd, you know, be, be with one of those people. And then after a while, it wasn't any fashionable anymore, and, uh, and so they were gone. That's what Jesus is talking about here. There are those people, kind of witnesses, who reject the truth. They, they follow Jesus, but after a while, they, they, they move on. And this is what Jesus had to say about those people in Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 10. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about his parables. And he said to him, you know, to you it's been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables. In other words, I have to teach them in parables so that they will understand. uh, So that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now, when you first read that verse, it sounds like Jesus was intentionally deceiving them so that they wouldn't get saved. That's not what it's saying at all. Those blinded by unbelief saw Jesus as a threat to their existence, still do to this day. People see Jesus, and it's a challenge to their lifestyle. They rejected him, and they didn't come to know the secret of God's kingdom. They rejected who Jesus was. They wanted to see miracles. They wanted to see all of those things happen. But they rejected him. They rejected the Son of God. What Jesus was saying in verse 12 was that there are those who see but don't really get what they're seeing. 
There are those who hear truth but don't understand it. And if they did perceive it and understand it, they would repent and be forgiven. That's what he was saying about it. He says, I'm teaching this, and if they ever do see it and understand it, they'll repent and they'll be forgiven. There are a lot of these types of people in churches today. I call them party Christians. They're everywhere. Uh, it's all about having a good time in your faith. Let's just have fun. And, and, and you know, Christianity is supposed to be fun, so let's have fun. Where do we get the idea that Christianity is supposed to be fun? I mean, I think you can have fun. Lord knows we do. But it's not about having fun. It's not about just having fun. We'll have fun when we're in heaven. But right now, we're living in a miserable, desperate, lonely, scary world. I mean, we are in the end times, folks. If you don't think we are, just look at what's happening around the world. I mean, do you realize the statement was made that Iran could have a nuclear weapon within six months? Now, remember, it wasn't too long ago they said, oh, it'll take two years. You know, it's going to be five years. Now they're saying six months. If they decide that they want a nuclear weapon, they could have one within six months. Uh, and, and this is a scary, scary time. And we have been assigned to this time at this point in history because God has a purpose and a plan that he wants to accomplish through you. Are you sick of me saying that? Then, uh, then you're going to be really sick because I'm not done. <laughs> God has put us here at this time, at this place, because he has a purpose. And it's not about having all, just having a good time. And I, I, I resent party Christians who, who think it's just all about having a good time. We see a lot of that in, in children's and, and youth ministries in churches all across America, and even some adult groups. But then when it's no longer fun, they're gone. In fact, the fallout rate from youth ministry into adult is horrific. The last figure I saw was something like 20% stay. 80% of young people fall away after they are too old to be in the youth ministry anymore. And they fall away because it's no longer fun. And when it's no longer fun, they're gone. They never get taught how to use the Word of God to deal with life. I remember when I was a youth minister, I started out in a youth ministry at Sycamore Hills Baptist Church. You know, I actually started out at Nolan Road part-time, but my first full-time job was at Sycamore Hills. Sycamore Hills had a youth house. They called, somebody had donated a house to the church, and it was right next door to the church. And that was the youth house. And so I just thought it would be cool to turn it into a really, really hip place, you know, where, where young people would want to come and hang out. And it was all about creating this, this really cool place to go. And the more I got into it, the more I realized how frustrating that is. First of all, because I wasn't cool. And secondly, because it wasn't about making it fun. If they wanted fun, there were lots of places and things to do. I was competing with a fun world for them. But what I needed to do was teach them the Word. That's what they needed. They needed to come to know God and have a relationship with Him. It was about, it was about focusing in on changing their life, not out of fellowship, but out of getting into what the Word of God says and how it can connect with their lives. Discipleship. It was about discipleship, and that was the focus. It is a brutal, listen to what I'm saying here, because it's well thought out. It is a brutal, sinful shame that some churches let young people move into the critical decision-making times of their lives without a biblical handle on how to face those choices. There are going to be pastors and Bible study teachers and churches who are going to have to give account for that. We do our young people and young adults a biblical, we do, we do a great disservice to them by not teaching them from a biblical perspective how to handle their finances and, and how to build healthy relationships and how to know God and how to follow God's will. We do them a horrible disservice. Why do we wait till they're adults to start teaching them this sort of thing? And what God was saying, what Jesus was saying, is there are people, we are creating people who think it's fun to follow Jesus, and then when it's no longer fun, they walk away from it. And he warned against that. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.